So uh, we've been doing a series uh, called This Is Us. And you know, everybody is in a season of transition and, and there's always a, a getting ready for the next season that's so important. Uh, now a lot of kids have like graduated, students are going on to college, and uh, now we celebrate kindergartners graduating kindergarten, going into first grade, you know, kids going from, from uh, elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school, and, and there's always a, a season, always a, a what's next. Uh, some of you are in different seasons of career, and you're like leaving one job and you're stepping into another one. Some of you are looking forward to retirement. You're planning it out. Some of you got the, like, the days counted on the calendar, right? Some of you are, are really looking forward to that next season. Some of you are about to get married, and it's like, woohoo, you know, and you're all excited about that. Some of you um, are stepping out of marriage, and things have happened there, and and you're kind of wondering what's next. And, and here's the deal. Whatever season you're in, you always want to be ready for what's next. And the time to be ready is now. The time to get ready for your next season is not when you're in the next season, but it's, it's before you get to the next season, right? And so you want to be able to look forward to what that season is. For some of you, uh, there's going to be something going on in your health. You're going to have one of the biggest breakthroughs you've ever experienced in the area of your health. For some of you, you're going to get news that you didn't didn't plan on getting about your health. But whatever that season is, God will meet you in that. And, and, and the key is, is, to, is to be prepared for what's next. Because life has a lot of drama. And it's always unfolding. Yeah, amen, right? Always unfolding around us. And sometimes we see it coming and sometimes we don't. But just because we know it's coming, it doesn't mean we're prepared for it. And so we want to make sure that in the season that we're in now, we're prepared for what's next. And I want to talk with you today specifically about marriage. But as I talk about marriage, you need to understand that everything that you hear today also applies to your business relationships, your relationships with people that you work with, your relationships with your best friends and other people that are in your life. The things that we talk about today actually affect every area of your life. But I especially, especially want to talk about marriage because marriage is really one of the most transformational relationships. I mean, nothing shapes you and molds you like marriage, right? I mean, nothing, nothing, I think it is one of God's favorite tools to teach us and to shape us and to mold us. And when it's done right, when you're like ready for it, and when you step into it and, 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 you, and, you, and you step into it kind of understanding what it's about, it can be absolutely fantastic. It can also be very painful too when it's not done in a way that is strategic. And, and we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna to talk about how marriage can really catch us off guard sometimes. And I don't know about you, but marriage is a big adjustment, is it not? Right? And so, I mean, you learn a lot of things when you get married that you didn't even think were a thing until you get married, right? I mean, like, excuse me, but is anybody with me that the toilet paper roll goes down the front of the, uh, the roll comes down forward. Is that, is anybody, am I the, uh, how many of you go, no, it's supposed to go down along the wall. How many of you? You guys are very passionate about that, too. And so, what, is there a third option? Who cares? <laughs> as long as there's toilet paper, we're happy. Yeah. That's good. Uh, or, or, or did you ever, like, this happened to us. Like, we got married, and, and I saw the tube of toothpaste squeezed in the middle. And you know, the funny thing is this, is that a lot of things, like, you don't even think about it, but suddenly you go, I'm not putting up with that for the rest of my life. And to this day, Maria says, I was the one that squeezed the middle of the tube. And I say, she was the one that squeezed the middle of the tube. But we got past all that. Now we use little bottles that you squeeze and we have our own, right? Got, got past all that. We're through that stuff. And there's all kinds of things that come up in marriage that, that you don't think about. And, and you know, marriage is that beautiful time when the two become one. The question is, which one are we going to become? <laughs> Right? Are we going to become her? Are we going to become him? And there's a kind of a collision sometimes of, of, of what we're going to be and, and who we're becoming. And, 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 and it's, it's amazing how things come out when you got married that you just didn't anticipate, didn't think of didn't realize was going to be a thing. And I can tell you that in the early years of our marriage, you guys, many of you know this, but I mean the first three years of our marriage, it was just nothing but fights, nothing but fights. 
And, and there was one time when, when, when Maria, uh, you know, my, my deal was this. When we would begin to experience conflict and all that tension began to rise in the house, everybody's got like at least one or, or two, one of two different uh, reactions. One is the fight mechanism, right? And the other one is the flight mechanism. How many of you are fighters? You're like, no, we're going to deal with this. Okay. How many of you are flight people? Like, yeah, I don't like the tension. I don't want to be in the same room. I don't want, right? You got the, got the flight thing. Well, I was the flight. And she was the fight. And, and it's not that she was mean. She was like, no, we're going to resolve this. And I can remember, man, the tension was there. We were going at it. And I was like, I'm getting out of here. Like, I just, I, get, get, away. get away. Get away. And so she goes and she blocks the door at the apartment. <laughs> Like, like this, okay? And, and, and she goes, no, you're gonna stay until we resolve this. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm getting out of here. And I, and I like tried to like move her aside a little bit and she just shakes me off like a linebacker, <laughs> you know? Just like this. And goes, no, we're gonna resolve this. And, and I, I cannot explain this, but something inside of me elevated so much that I grabbed her by the shoulders and I shoved her as hard as I could. And I went, where did that come from? I was like, I never thought I would lay hands on my wife. And I was like, where did that come from? And, 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 and like sometimes in our home, it didn't look anything like Jesus followers. Nothing that was going on resembled that at all. And, and here's what I know. I know that if I could like go in your house and watch how you interact, or if I could ride in your car and hear how you talk to each other, there'd be times that you'd go, I wish you were riding with us right now. I wish you weren't here. Because all of us have moments where, where things come out of us. We go, where did that come from? And maybe you have to get away from the situation a little bit. And you kind of go, I, I didn't, what is that? And, and here's the deal. When you start going, where did that come from? It came from somewhere. It came from somewhere. And when you're experiencing that in your relationship, you got to take a look at that. Today, we're going to take a look at that. Next week, we're going to talk about strategies for really getting down in, in this and, and being able to work through it. But, but James, the half-brother of Jesus, he wrote about this. And he, and, he, and he starts out in James chapter 4, he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And look what he says next. He says, don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? No, 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 she's the problem. No, 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 he's the problem. He says, no, they are not your enemy, and they are not the problem. Don't the fights and quarrels come from the evil desires that wage war within you? And you gotta start there. And he goes on to say this. He goes, you want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. Now, doesn't that sound like an exaggeration? Right? I mean, James, he's writing to the church. You think that the Christians were like literally scheming and killing each other? No, they weren't. What is he saying? He's saying, look, don't you understand there are two ways that you can approach this. You can do what the world does to fight and get your way. And it comes from a seed a seed of resentment and selfishness. And, and he's not saying anything new. Jesus said this. Here's what Jesus said. Hey, if you hate somebody, you've already killed them. James is saying the same thing. He says, do you not understand? This is part of the brokenness of the world that we live in and don't think you're exempt from it. You have the same brokenness that the thing that drives your warring is in within you. You have the seeds of your own destruction within you. He says, don't you realize that that's inside of you? Don't you realize that when you look at your spouse like the enemy, don't you realize that when you hate them and when you resent them, don't you realize what's going on, that it's a war within you? And that you, if you want to try to win the way the world wins, you can make that choice. But how's that working for you? He says, you're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. God, change her, please. Change him, 
please. God's like, well, how about if I change you? He says, you know, you don't get it because you, you just want to, you want only what will give you pleasure, what will make you feel like, well, I won, good. I'm satisfied at the outcome of this. And it's in us. And so what is that that's in us? And here's what I can tell you. When you get married, or when you got married, there were three things that you brought to the altar with you. Hopefully, you brought a ring. But you also brought baggage that had your name on it. And they are the two most powerful things that you brought. And you didn't realize it, and they didn't realize it, but you bring it. And every single man and woman brings the same three things to the altar. And the first thing that you brought were your hopes. Your dreams, as you were growing up and you thought about the way marriage was gonna be, and you thought about what the house was gonna be like and how this was gonna look. And, and, and if you came from a great home, then everything inside of you is like, oh, I want the same thing. We're gonna make that happen. And you've got a picture that you carry in your head. And, and you don't realize that they also have hopes that they've brought to the relationship. And, but, but your picture is, is strong and your picture feels right. And here's the deal. You grew up with these pictures. They don't weigh anything to you. It doesn't feel like you've got baggage. You just... You just have them. And so you, you think about, oh, man, we're going to live out in the country. It's going to be great. But your partner, they're thinking, oh, we're going to live in the city. It's going to be vibrant. And you think, I'm going to have 2.3 children. I'm not sure what point three looks like, but it's going to be great. And your spouse may be going, actually, I don't think I want children. I'm not sure if I want children yet. Haven't made up my mind about that yet. You carry hope and you say, well, man, I can't wait. We're going to have dogs. And your partner is going, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Just, you're going to have other pets other than dogs. No, don't do that. (laughs) And you go, man, I can't, we're going to have a minivan. It's going to be great. And he's like, I'm going to have a motorcycle. It's going to be awesome. And you got these pictures that you carry around inside of you. And, and, and And it's powerful and it's beautiful the way it lives inside of you. And it's what you brought with you. And, 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 and here's the deal. You brought something else with you that you didn't think about and you didn't know. And the other thing that you brought were your fears. And coming out of the painful things that you saw happen, or the painful things that you lived through, you also brought your fears to the altar, and you didn't know it, and they didn't know it either. And some of those fears are driven by the home that you grew up in. And maybe the the fears live inside of you like this. Well, I'm not going to let a woman control me the way my mom controlled my dad. I can tell you that right now. I'm afraid that would happen. Or your fear is, I'm not going to let a man have power over me. I'm not going to entrust him with my life and our livelihood the way my dad was and mom were when my dad abandoned us and my mom didn't even know how to work. And there's no way I'm going to trust a man like that. Or maybe what it was was the way my parents had a marriage. I'm never going to do that. I don't even want to get married. And is it any wonder why so many young people today Choose to just live together because they've seen what happens when a family is torn apart and they live through it. And they're like, I don't want my kids to ever experience what I experienced, but I don't want to be alone either. You know, Hugh Grant, I don't know if you saw this in the news, but he's getting married at 57 years of age. 57. He's got three kids with with a lady. In 2015, they interviewed Uh, Hugh Grant, and here's what he said. He said, I'm not really a believer in marriage. I've seen very few good examples, maybe five in my life, but I think otherwise it's a recipe for mutual misery. (laughs) And some some of you, grown up, and your greatest fear is I I don't ever want to recreate the kind of pain that I experienced. And, and when you blend families together, it gets even more complicated because a lot of times, you're, as a parent, you're concerned about the pain that your kids experience. And now you're gonna blend families together and one of your greatest fears is that your kids are gonna get hurt somehow. And so rather than 
husband and wife being up here, being one, and the kids kind of falling in line underneath that, you're like, no, 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 no. My kids are up here. I got to protect them. You're down here somewhere. And suddenly it's like mom and kids and dad or dad and kids and mom and mom and dad are wondering, where do I fit in to this? And suddenly you see the perfect storm and how our, our fears control us and how our fears continue to plague us. And, and you know, if you came out of a great family, then probably you've got a lot of dreams. And this is like, it's all upside, you see. But if you came out of a lot of pain, then this is the big controlling piece for you. And you carry that into the relationship. And depending on the kind of family you had, like if you grew up in a home where there's a lot of conflict, you know, everybody kind of takes a role in, in all families and, and depending on what was going on in your home, if you had a lot of conflict, maybe the way that you learned to survive was I'm gonna put up my dukes or maybe you learned, no, 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 I just wanna, I wanna retreat to a peaceful place. And so now you find yourself in a relationship where you're, you, you wanna experience some emotional intimacy but this strategy for survival that you learned has created a wall and you don't even know it, but there's a fear that drives your actions and your behavior. I just want peace at all costs, honey. That's all I want. And so when your wife asks you to share how you really feel, you say what you think she wants to hear. Because where you came from, it wasn't emotionally safe to say what you really felt. And we learn these strategies and these ways of kind of building a false sense of who we are. And so growing up, for me, growing up as a, as a Japanese kid in a farming community that was predominantly German and white people, I stuck out like a sore thumb and the racism and the name calling and the, all those things that I grew up with. And so I learned early on in fourth grade that the way to deal with that kind of pain is to develop a humor that takes the first shot. And if I could, if I could make fun of that kid before anybody made fun of me, or if I could take control of the situation and make a joke about myself, then I controlled what was being laughed at. And they could laugh at my actions instead of laughing at the person that I was. And it was a survival mechanism. And what I learned is, is those, those things that I built around myself to keep from getting hurt, those interfered with the person I was created to be and the ability to connect with my wife in an authentic way. And you've experienced the same thing. And we go, in, we go through life learning these strategies and these ways of doing things. And here's the deal. You and I, we've just grown up with it. We don't even think about it. It, it doesn't weigh a thing to us. It's just who we are. And when we showed up at the altar, we had it with us the whole time. And even these things that, that interfere and we, it cause us to collide with somebody that we love deeply. These things, even in the best of cases, with our hopes, these can become toxic. And they become toxic when we take these things and we saddle the other person with it. And we go, hey, hey, you get to make all my dreams come true. And you get to live up to my expectations because I've got a picture in my head that you need to make happen. And by the way, don't make these mistakes. And even though they're weightless to us, even the very best things that we hope for, when we hand somebody else the baggage of our hopes and hand it to them, it doesn't feel like something that's weightless. It feels like a burden and an expectation by which they will be judged and accepted or not accepted. This feels like the beginning of a battleground. And James Ask the question, do you, do you understand what's causing the fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the evil desires, desires that were good, but the way that you're handling them turned it. Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? He says, wow, it can happen. Our hopes and and our fears, we carry those into our relationship and we don't even know it. 
And you get married and pretty soon you begin to discover what they are. And you've got to be aware of it. You've got to go into it with an awareness. Because here's the deal. If you don't have any awareness of it, you will fight and you will wage war. And there are different ways that people wage war. Right? One of those is convince. And this is, by the way, my problem. This is the one that I have to watch for. Like, honey, here's what I think we should do. Well, no, I actually don't want to do it that way, she'll say. And I'll go, no, 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 well, here's why it's a good idea that we do it my way. And I convince, and I convince, and I don't yell, I don't scream. I just keep trying to persuade her. And, and every now and then she'll go, actually, I said no. And you keep trying to convince me. And I have to go, thank you for helping me to see that. You see, it'll tear us down. So, so you can try to convince. Another one is you can convict, make them feel guilty. Well, really, doing it your way, really, that wouldn't, they, I don't know why you feel that way. You shouldn't feel that way. If we just did it my way, look, I've got some pretty great hopes for us. If you would just take this, we'll get there. But you shouldn't fight me on this. Really, I know better. So sometimes we're trying to make somebody feel guilty. You, 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 you know, you, <laughs> after all, you really owe me. You should do this for me. The other one is control. I, if, I could, if I could control you, and so the way I used to do it is if Maria didn't go the way I wanted to go, I didn't get mad, I didn't throw anything, I didn't scream. I just froze her out. And I created distance. And I just kind of was in a room but went away somewhere else. And that's a way of control. Sometimes rage is a way of controlling, right? If you don't give me what I want, I'm gonna make your life miserable. I will wage war. And we learn these techniques and these methods growing up in the homes that we grew up in. We've seen them. That's why they don't weigh anything to us because it's, it's everything that we've ever seen and ever known. So we do all these things. And the other one is coerce. I'm just gonna force you to do it. You better do it or I'm out of here. And by the way, that is an option. And some people decide, you know what? I look at your baggage. I didn't sign up for this. And, and people will say, they changed. Well, actually, no. They actually are the same person with all the same baggage. You just never took the time to discover right. what their baggage was or what yours was. And you could choose to, to just go, I didn't sign up for this, nope. And you can go ahead and leave. And you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna show up at another altar someday with the exact same set Amen. of baggage. And so you really don't wanna keep repeating the same patterns over and over and over again. You don't wanna do that. And so, so where do you begin? Like, what do you What do you do? Well, you gotta make room for God because what James is saying is, look, there's two ways you could do this. You can wage war the way the world does. You could take that seed and let it be the seed of your own destruction or you could do it a different way. So he goes on to say in James 4, starting in verse seven, he said, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, I'm not following the devil. All of those thoughts that keep telling you she's the enemy, all those thoughts that keep telling you that he's the enemy, that's not coming from God. And he says, come close to God and God will come close to you. He's just waiting for the invitation to enter into your relationship. Wash your hands you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. The strategy that you've chosen is not God's strategy. The strategy you've chosen is to wage war. How is it working for you? See, at a certain point, you've got to decide, are you going to fight for your marriage or are you going to fight against it? And when you fight for it, now there's room for God to do something says, let there, be, let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness for what you have done. Uh, let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. And you may go, well, how can I just change my emotions like that? Well, you can't do it as long as you're judging your partner and thinking that they're the problem. So you've got to humble yourself before God and say, God, show me what's going on inside of me. 
Help me to understand the baggage that I brought into this relationship and how it's living inside of me in such a destructive way. And the way you get to a place where you can take your sadness and let it become gloom, where you can let your, your, your joy bring you to a place where you're broken is when you let God show you what is happening to the person to whom you pledged your love. And the one to whom you said, I do, and I will love you forever. And it's like God just going, if you could see their heart and what you're doing to it with your hatred and your rejection or freezing them out or your distance, if you could see their heart shriveling, if you could see their heart breaking, if you could see their heart bleeding to this person that I've entrusted to you, then you can get there. And I'm telling you, I had to get to a place where that's what I saw. And where you can begin to go, oh man, what am I doing? Where did that come from? God says, it's coming from here. Then God, I need you to help me. And I need you to help me to see my hopes and my fears and how I have carried those and how I'm waging war against my marriage instead of for it. God, I need you to show me this. And, and, and instead, of, instead of getting in this pattern of, of you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to convince them or I'm going to convict them or I'm going to control them or I'm going to coerce them, there's a different step. And here's what it is. James says it. James 5, 16. It's called confess. And he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. God, show me what I'm doing, and then you go to your partner, to your spouse, and you say, I am so sorry. I can see how I'm living out of my hopes and out of my fears and how I have been carrying those in a way that is tearing us Apart, And when you begin to take ownership for your part in it, man, suddenly there's the space where God goes, you want to see a miracle happen? You want to see a divine healing happen? In that relationship where you feel like all hope is lost, where you feel like there's no, no chance at all, God says, you just watch me work. When two people are willing to humble themselves before God. Two people are willing to do that. And two people can look at each other and say, please forgive me for the way that I've been treating you. Please forgive me for confusing you with my mother and my mother issues. Please forgive me for confusing you with my father and my father issues. Please forgive me for projecting all my fears upon you and guarding myself and protecting myself from what you could do to me instead of actually trusting you with my heart. Forgive me. And when two people start there, God says, you will be healed. And here's what I could tell you, and I'm talking from experience. What you see as something that is impossible, and what you see as something that is insurmountable, and what you see as something that is just too far gone, when two people humble themselves before God and make space for God to work and take the hard step of humbling yourself and confessing and asking forgiveness, there is a powerful thing that God will do in your life and it will be the most transformational event. It'll be the beginning of something that other people will look at and go, how in the world did that happen? And you will see God do a miracle in your relationship when you do it that way. Next week, we're going to talk about strategies for what do you do with this stuff. But for now, here's your assignment. What causes the fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that wage war within you? What are you going to do with them? Why don't you take them before God? Why don't you let the counselor counsel you, the Holy Spirit of God? Why don't you let him help you to see 
the way that you carried your hopes. Let them see the way that you let your fears determine what your actions are. And why don't you take what he shows you and go to your partner and say, here's what's going on in me. Forgive me. We can't keep doing it this way. I want God in the middle of what we're going through. And I believe that he could do something powerful. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes if you would. Whether you're heading into marriage or whether that's a someday thing that you dream of, are you aware of what lives inside of you? Or maybe you're married now and you are fully aware or maybe you've become aware today. Are you willing to take that and bring it all to God and invite him into your marriage, into your home? Are you willing to try a new strategy where you don't have to scheme and you don't have to manipulate but you can surrender? I want to pray for you right where you are. Father God, Thank you for the truth of your word. And God, you have a vision for every marriage, every marriage that's going to be, every marriage that's here. Lord, where life can happen, where people can thrive. Lord, where your spirit is so at work because you find there willing parties who want to be shaped, want to be changed, and want love to flourish. God, May you continue to press in. I pray, God, against every hard heart that is dug in. May you bring a brokenness to that heart. I pray, God, for every heart that is looking for insight. May you provide that wisdom and help see, help them to see exactly what they need to see. And Father, may you take these things and begin a preparation for a season of blessing that is yet to come. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for showing us what that looks like through Jesus. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.